Um, okay, we're called to order. And please rise. We have a pledge, uh, a flag behind the deputy chief that uh, will do as well. I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag, to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and to, and the, to Republic the Republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, liberty, liberty justice, justice for all. Thank you all. Please remain standing for a moment of silence uh, for all fly fallen firefighters throughout the country and world, but particularly in our own backyard, uh, firefighter, fighter, fighter, Ricardo uh, Rico Torres, um, who we lost recently in the New Haven fire, and please include uh, Lieutenant Sudman Rakin, and I think I murdered his first name, who is in critical condition from the same fire incident um, at the burn unit. Thank you. Um, we are hoping, based on the latest guidance that was released by CDC, um, that next month we will, in fact, uh, be able to meet in person. Uh, we have to wait for the state and town guidelines, but it's a month from now, and hopefully we'll be far enough along there. Um, the rest of things I have to report really will come up in the strategic planning discussion uh, under the chief's monthly report. And so unless there are questions for me at this stage, I will turn it over to the chief. Uh, everybody, everybody good? Okay. Then, chief, you're up. Yep. Okay. Thank you. And thank you, Commissioner. Um, uh, just as it relates to CDC guidance, uh, we did confirm, or as a result of numerous reports that are following up, uh, the CDC uh, said that uh, wearing masks both inside and outside is not necessary for those that are fully vaccinated, um, and uh, confirmed that the governor is not going to change the sector rules under, uh, particularly as it relates to masks for Executive Order 7, Triple N, uh, until those requirements expire next Wednesday, uh, May 19th. And that was, uh, the expiration was expected we were uh, anticipating some further guidance on indoor mask wearing and what context or settings that might be required. I think the uh, CDC guidelines changing today uh, clearly give us a pathway uh, for uh, mask-free uh, environment. Um, as it relates to in-person meetings, uh, the first select woman has charged uh, myself and IT Director uh, David Kelly uh, to incorporate uh, the lessons learned from our COVID experience to ensure that uh, while many boards, commissions, and committees, you know, prefer to meet in person as we do, um, that a provision for remote access uh, be uh, maintained uh, following uh, the relaxation of uh, restrictions. And that would give the public the opportunity uh, to participate or at least uh, listen uh, where they didn't have that uh, uh, opportunity in the past. Uh, occasionally we would have a conference call where a commissioner would uh, call in, but we never provide that universally for public access. Uh, so the way that I see it, because it is a heavy lift uh, for all of the various boards, commissions, and committees um, to maintain virtual participation. Um, at the very least, I, I, I believe the expectation will be uh, that uh, uh, virtual access to listen in um, will be required of all of those boards, commissions, and committees uh, with the understanding that if residents want to participate in person, or if they want to participate, uh, they would uh, uh, be 
um, advised to appear in person um, just because right now the town of Fairfield, as you all know, that have served the town for a long time, there is not great meeting space um, and there is little built-in technology to support um, virtual meetings in a meaningful way. Uh, so one of the things that we're doing is trying to find a uh, better meeting space, more technology that is uh, plug and play uh, that would make it very convenient for departments to not only have virtual participation, but uh, I think of planning and zoning where displays and, and uh, presentations are normal parts of that uh, and, and a lot of public participation, be able to not only include the public, but also to display uh, in a better manner uh, some of the uh, material that is commonly part of those meetings. Um, so uh, we're working on that, but I do expect as the chairwoman uh, that we will be uh, in person in June, but uh, I will follow up. Uh, as a matter of fact, I have a meeting with uh, Jackie Bertalone, the chief of staff, and David Kelly, the IT director, tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. Yeah, and uh, our preference, I think, would be to provide the virtual access um, we're, you know, we're obviously set up in the room that the de deputy is in, that we can do that pretty easily. Um, and so I would hope we would do that for the public. So, okay. You, you mean have the opportunity to participate virtually? Yeah. Well, we yep. may only at this stage be able to have them uh, watch. Yep. That's yep. okay. But let's start wherever we can. So what we'll do, what I expect that we will do is uh, that we will establish uh, our you know, regular, reestablish our regular meeting space at the fire school uh, conference room, which provides a uh, good opportunity to connect to the technology there. Uh, we'll work out the details and uh, try to provide the most advanced uh, uh, technology that uh, is practical on a monthly basis. So, um, but yes, uh, I would expect that, you know, certainly access and preferably participation if, if we can make that work. Mm -hmm. so we'll all be there. It's, it's, so it, it, you know, the system is there and it would actually probably be a little bit easier for us uh, than some of the others because uh, it's in, in a facility that we manage and maintain um, uh, and can set it up a little bit easier. So if, uh, if you would like, I would like to uh, review with you, with the commission, uh, the outline for strategic planning for the Fairfield Fire Department. As I sent it in my correspondence to the commission, um, I did provide a document back at uh, first of the year uh, that covered uh, the department's operations, facilities, equipment, personnel in a very detailed way. Um, and in conversations that the chairwoman and I have had since that time, um, and her um, uh, in, with it, with her input, uh, it was clear that you know that is more of a historical document. Is that uh, the right way to phrase that, Chairwoman uh, Brennan, uh, as opposed to a planning document? Uh, and um, much of it looks backwards uh, towards what has been accomplished and. Um, what's in place uh, as opposed, uh, although there were some references to future planning, uh, it really did not serve as a strategic planning document. Uh, so we have uh, uh, developed um, a, a plan for the major topics uh, that um, uh, are strategic in nature that uh, certainly uh, concern the deputy and I and members of the department about, uh, you know, the critical issues uh, facing us. And I offer uh, this, and we'll just go over it. Uh, you have it um, in your correspondence, and we'll go over it tonight, um, and seek input from the commission on any other parts and pieces that should be added, uh, expanded, or changed um, uh, because this is the um, the charter responsibility of the commission, and we want to make sure that you have an opportunity to influence this document. Uh, so there are uh, um, three major areas uh, that uh, we feel that uh, are critical uh, 
uh, to evaluate um, in the near term uh, to provide a basis for longer term solutions, but uh, certainly need uh, that uh, near term evaluation. And <clears throat> first, the location of our stations. As we have seen, there's been significant development uh, in the community. Um, and, um, you know, yeah, probably the uh, most significant uh, um, recent development development is uh, the number of assisted care or assisted living facilities and major housing developments uh, that include um, somewhere in the neighborhood of 100, 140 uh, uh, additional residential units per development. Um, we've seen one that uh, is uh, in the planning stages for Black Rock Turnpike office at the High Ho Hotel. Uh, there is another one that is planned on North Park Avenue. Um, the furthest reach uh, of uh, our district or our community, uh, it borders right up uh, against uh, uh, the parkway uh, entrance at exit uh, 47 and um, it would re represent to us the longest response time for a major facility like that. Um, so we know that you know, the, the circumstances on the ground are changing, uh, the challenges to the department uh, and where our stations are located and, you know, and, and what that development will look like over time. We know that Congress uh, uh, drive, uh, a commerce drive uh, and uh, the area around the metro station is changing. Uh, there may be zoning changes that change uh, the built environment uh, over there. And I think that you know, it is important as we make million dollar decisions on fire apparatus and million dollar decisions on um, equipment and think about our, our staffing levels you know, all of those uh, developments and, and long-term uh, development, uh, uh, you know, trends in the community need to be evaluated. So uh, we want to look at our, you know, uh, distribution of our stations and, you know, you know evaluate their adequacy, uh, look at the types of calls. Um, we have done this in the past, and I think I shared with it, uh, with the commission going back some four years or so ago, uh, when you, we looked at um, our calls for service at where, what were then the assisted living facilities and nursing homes. I think we need to revisit that um, uh, if that uh, represents significant development and potential more development in town, just what kind of burden they place on the department um, and, as well as other uh, facilities that, that are not just one-offs um, uh, that uh, you know the school systems, um, um, you know, the the I ninety five. You know what what I think a, a more in depth analysis across all call types um, and where uh, you know they produce a heat map uh, that show where the concentrations are of multiple repeated um, uh, response for service um, will help us understand uh, our service demands uh, as we go forward. Certainly response times and you know, that North Park Avenue uh, development is one that uh, uh, is concerning. Um, and how this relates to other related service, AMR uh, is an important partner uh, in us, uh, with us and the issues of response time uh, are, are important, our response time uh, as well as theirs. And, we know and we've seen has been reported in the media, certainly in our conversations with uh, AMR, uh, there is a paramedic shortage in the state of Connecticut. Uh, it's one that's been building for some time. Uh, the uh, paramedic, uh, the, the paramedic programs are not turning out nearly enough paramedics uh, to sustain uh, all of the paramedic services, whether the municipal, or uh, a private concern or a volunteer. Um, there's just not enough paramedics in the system to uh, fill all of the need. And it has been a growing problem. It affects you know, advanced life support in the field. 
Um, we have had uh, several conversations. The deputy and I have met with the regional director for AMR, and we continue to uh, look at um, those kind of issues. But again, that plays into this whole issue of station locations, where we put resources and uh, how we deploy them. So um, that is the first major uh, issue that uh, uh, I want to uh, include in this planning process. And I will pause there if there are any comments or questions or issues you would, any of the commissioners would like to add into that discussion. I do have one, uh, Madam Chair. Go ahead. Um, Chief, I know we had spoken previously about the, uh, it didn't seem feasible, I think during a previous cost study about uh, trying to take on an ambulance service internally with the department. Is that still the case that you're thinking of here? So, is if it's a straight up replacement for a commercial provider um, for like services, um, I would say, why would I? I, I would uh, take a position that it it's not economically feasible or advisable to spend a two hundred and fifty to five hundred thousand uh, potentially more. Uh, to provide the same level of service that we're getting from a commercial provider. Uh, why would we take on that responsibility, uh, the liability? Um, it is a heavy lift and there is not a clear legal path to take over or remove them from um, their primary service area, which is granted by the State Department of Health Office of Emergency Medical Service. It's not under the local control. So we would have to fight to get it. And in order to fight to get it, we would have to establish ourselves as a paramedic. We don't provide paramedicine right now. Uh, so the state would not entertain a request from us to take over a uh, paramedic level service because we don't have a pre proven capability. So we would have to, in order to get to, to uh, consider taking over ambulance type duties, we would have to establish ourselves as a paramedic level service. And that is a long path um, of development to get there. It would take several years. So that's if, and, and that's the calculation that, you know, I've wrestled with, um, but that's assuming that AMR is a providing an adequate level of service. You want to spend more money than you need to uh, to replace something that's working well. Right now, it's you know they're having staff. I don't want to overstate. You know, we have had an, uh, several issues with specific calls um, that uh, we were dissatisfied with the level of service, and I'm sure that that's true of every community um, that is receiving a contracted service or a service provided by another provider. Um, and we've, re we've resolved those issues uh, with AMR staff um, to our satisfaction. However, they do repeat and <laughs> repeating more frequently. Um, so if AMR or a provider is not providing an adequate level of service and places the community members uh, and the public at risk, because we're not getting adequate response time for uh, for advanced life support, then it would be worth um, investigating uh, and certainly justifiable to spend two hundred and fifty to five hundred thousand dollars more in the municipal budget if we can provide the the level of care that the community expects from a fire department and a whoever is providing advanced life support. Um, so that's a roundabout way of saying, I don't know uh, whether this is, whether we're at that tipping point or not. Um, you know, they, but there had they, there needs to be a, an understanding of where that tipping point is uh, to make such a, a quantum leap in changing how we provide or what kind of services we provide. Um, it is an issue that uh, we are dealing with inside the department uh, 
you know, when I had a conversation with the chief staff, uh, uh, senior staff just this afternoon on this particular subject because we had had a recent call uh, where their response time was delayed and, and it was very frustrating. It turns out it was a dispatcher error. Uh, it was a um, thought to be a drunken person, uh, not a, um, a uh, fall down a flight of stairs and a unconscious, unresponsive patient. Uh, so um, there was a, a processing error on their part, uh, as well as a long delay because they didn't put it in the priority, the correct priority. Uh, their response time was delayed. They didn't, you know, rush uh, any available unit. They thought that they could queue it up and and not require mutual aid to come in and cover. Um, if it was a higher, if it was coded correctly, we would have gotten a mutual aid uh, unit to respond. Uh, so we're dealing with those kind of issues, and I think that this is exactly the reason why a, a deep dive uh, in the uh, EMS system is necessary so that we can understand um, what the challenges are and will we be in the same position as any other provider uh, struggling with finding qualified certified licensed paramedic if there is not enough paramedics in the system um, then we are going to be challenged as much as uh, the other providers. Maybe as uh, maybe our pay is a little bit higher. Maybe the job security would be better. Uh, it would be a little bit more successful. But other fire departments that are providing paramedic level care are struggling with um, the issues that I described AMR uh, as relate to us. Well, and chief. Um... If we were to start that evaluation because they're falling down on service, wouldn't the other alternative be to look at other providers and service levels that we not try to build that service on Correct. our own, which yep. quite frankly, the numbers sound small to me at a quarter of a million to a half a million uh, as an investment. Um, and we'd have to evaluate against uh, both. And if the schools are producing enough people, it's not really a question of pay, it's a question of pipeline. Right, and uh, I don't know, um, I don't have good visibility on other service providers, but yes, the pathway in to an EMS system uh, to build capability is not to start with building your own, from scratch, it is to, you know, if we had control of the um, the PSA, the primary service area uh, um, license for the town of Fairfield, uh, then we could hire and contract with whomever we deem is most appropriate. Um, and, um, and that could be a, another private provider. Um, but again, uh, the challenge is, you know, bridge, uh, AMR represents uh, a company that has a deep bench, um, and um, everybody else is smaller than that. Um, yep. So uh, it is uh, issues that I, I think that we need to to uh, grapple with. Um, you know, the other, you know, there, there's a couple. I mean, there's a number of different ways, and we have had um, preliminary conversations uh, with AMR. Um, and maybe we provide paramedic engine companies, and this is this is the way fire departments uh, typically get started in paramedicine. Is uh, we provide the paramedic, and they provide a basic life support ambulance for transport. Um, so there are uh, other ways to do that, and we've had conversations with the union president, um, who and and you know. When we had conversations a couple of year or investigation a couple of years ago, um, we spent quite a bit of time, and and I know that the union was very has been very interested um, in uh, participating in uh, pre-hospital care at the paramedic level. So there are a couple a couple of different um, uh, ways that we can improve the level of service. None of them have an immediate um, um, payback uh, or, or capability. Um, it, it, all of them will take some time to develop. So 
Um, it's not like we can just call up another company today and say, we want you to start tomorrow. Um, we're prevented, we're absolutely prevented by OEMS from doing that. Um, so it's worth taking the six months to, you know, start this process of further evaluations to, um, to uh, see what our options are, but at the same time, uh, keeping pressure on AMR on a daily basis, uh, to make sure that, uh, they are providing the level of care that they promised, which is two ambulances in town, uh, 24 hours a day. Thanks, Chief. I just want to nip that in the bud based on discussions that have been had in the past. So I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, I mean, this is a a, you know, a senior staff in the department. The chiefs uh, and I uh, have, and and several are, and our EMS officer. I mean, this is uh, an active conversation, um, and I think that what I hope to do is more formalize uh, that process through the study. Yep. Just to make sure they're prepared to support you. Yeah, Chief, at that suggestion, I might break that piece out as a fourth element. Right now, it's part of the overall station location. No, if you look at the next page, it is a separate. Oh, yes. Discussion. Okay. Fine. Yeah. Uh, we have we have actually gone right. from we you know I want to go back onto the station location and find yep. out if there's anything else that the commissioners would like to add. To that, I would say the other thing to think about is useful sources of information that could help us in this analysis. And one of the things I have already suggested to the chief is that the Board of Education typically uh, contracts with outside um, specialists to develop statistical models about population uh, by geography so that they can do school districting. And that looks at uh, both family kinds of things, but also building uh, uh, impact and that. So that may be a source of information. And if you come up with any others, please uh, pass them on to the chief. Rob Sinto, I, uh, since I can't see you, I don't want to check in um, whether you need anything uh, or want to comment. Can we hear him, Deputy, if he speaks up? Uh, yes, let me just make sure. You can hear me now. Just said unmuted. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm all good. I'm, I'm following everything. I'm okay. all good. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Anyone else? No, I just want to say thanks. You can mute me. Support you. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, Bob, you're going to need to I'm mute gonna, one of your mics. Mute one of your mics. Because we're getting an echo now. Okay. Um, is there anything more to be said about the emergency medical services, Chief? Your second. Nope, I think that uh, that uh, uh, you know provides you a good overview of where we're, uh, what our challenges for studies are. Okay. Uh, then the last one. The last one is staffing equipment. The staffing and equipment. Um, as you know, we have uh, looked at. Uh, you know, the fire marshal's office and spent uh, a lot of time uh, discussing the need for additional staffing uh, in the fire marshal's office. Um, at the same time, um, you know, the, the daily routines, um, you know, for our personnel are chock full uh, every day, um, day in and day out, um, where we're, we're juggling how to get all of the work that needs to be done, uh, not only station equipment, uh, but training, but also um, what we are doing in the field uh, and, you know, what, uh, you know, it, whether it's smoke detector or surveys and uh, house visits to pre-fire planning at our commercial properties, um, you know, there, there is a lot to do. Um, and as we add in additional housing units and development on Fairfield, uh, that you know the demands and the number of um, simultaneous calls for service go up. And uh, now, instead of a response time from the neighborhood fire station that may be out at another call, 
um, a fire station or two away uh, is now the primary provider. Uh, and looking at uh, all of that call data uh, will be important to, you know, get a snapshot at, at this point in time, you know, where we are so we can track it going forward to understand the impact of this other development. Uh, that other development, you know, it, it's, as it relates to, you know, demands on time, um, a single family dwelling, a small commercial building, uh, response to those are fairly straightforward and simple. Access is easy. Uh, Communication is easy. All of our equipment is designed around uh, those types of emergencies. Uh, you, if we start to add high rise and large multifamily uh, developments, um, that that, um, that those demands change. Um, uh, everything takes longer. Takes more people. Uh, to do it effectively, um, we are a one ladder truck uh, department. Uh, you add in more uh, high rises, you know, it would require us to evaluate when we replace the rescue truck, um, uh, um, which was purchased in 2014, you know, in seven to 10 years, you know, does that go back to a second ladder truck? You know, those types of longer term decisions. Uh, but, you know, we need to start collecting data now um, and uh, any, um, you know, any um, impact of changes in our EMS uh, footprint uh, would also impact our staffing level. Um, you know, and, at, at this point, adding more burden to the daily routines uh, will require that we consider additional staffing. Um, and look at how to do that. You know, the, our neighboring communities, uh, um, uh, we rely on them for mutual aid that's built into the system. Uh, it's not intended and it's not feasible to rely on them for those overlapping calls that, uh, uh, you, know, you know, maybe a, a, a medical emergency or um, um, uh, something other than a fire, uh, but require immediate response. So. Um, so that is, so the changing environment to the built environment is going to be important. Um, you know, we've looked at the training division. How do we accomplish everything that needs to be done at the training division with the existing staff down there? Um, as well as, uh, uh, the other, um, divisions of the department. So, um, when we think about staffing, it, it's all of those issues, uh, that impact our service delivery model. Uh, that really was built, you know, the, the staffing level change. I think there was one additional staff um, on the ladder truck back in the or mid uh, 2000, like 2005 or so. Um, but before that, you know, the staffing on the fire department has been fairly consistent for decades. Uh, it's it's a time to you know start look at the changes in the community uh, to see how they will affect our service delivery model and if we need to start to um, anticipate uh, changes. Um, and again, uh, those issues that I discussed earlier regarding station location, <coughs> certainly plan development, population shift, construction trends, um, you know, fixed fire protection. Uh, I know the fire marshal's office uh, works very hard uh, to ensure that um, when sprinklers are required, we get a, a full um, a commercial uh, sprinkler system installed that includes all of the, you know, a, a, there's a 13 and a 13 residential is how they describe uh, or how they categorize. Um, residential sprinkler systems do not provide 100% protection. Um, unoccupied spaces, small closets uh, typically are excluded. As a cost saving measure, uh, again, we've talked about uh, you know, the construction te techniques that uh, uh, don't withstand the effects of fire very well. Um, and uh, we've seen in other parts of the country, um, you know, devastating fires in uh, multifamily residences. Uh, so, want to make sure that we are pushing hard to get the full 13 system uh, in that. And uh, uh, so that we are uh, anticipating uh, the development and the demands on the department. 
And lastly, are we buying the right fire equipment? You know, I would have maybe 10 years ago, you know, with construction, we thought that, you know, we in Fairfield maybe had been maxed out and, you know, what the built environment is, is the built environment. And, you know, you look at, you know, the size and type and capability of our apparatus. Um, you know, 10 years ago, I wouldn't have said, well, I think that uh, we're probably, you know, you could think about um, maybe um, a, a more compact um, uh, piece of equipment. We try to keep all of our apparatus as small as possible. Uh, the trouble is the tools and equipment, the specialized equipment uh, continue to, you know, require us to increase our carrying capacity uh, for that specialized equipment. Uh, and then you add in uh, the challenges of high rise fires, all the hose lays become much longer. And that means you need more storage space on the apparatus to reach um, the seat of the fire uh, with pre-connected hose lines. So um, those types of issues uh, play into it as well. So it's, you know, uh, staffing and equipment uh, uh, is a pretty broad subject area uh, that we need to tackle. Um, so commissioners, both now and in the next couple of weeks, if you have other topics that you think need to be addressed, um, please bring them up to the chief. The other thing I'd like you to think about is what aspect of this you might want to get involved in recognizing that the staff will do all of the research kind of work, but at key points for presentations and the opportunity to ha lead a discussion, have a discussion, it would be useful to have a commissioner perspective and we can split up uh, among the topics. And um, so I'd like you to think about and pick a topic that you'd like to work with the department on recognizing uh, we're all volunteers, so we need to manage your time well, but I think in the research analysis stage that deals with what's our assumptions, and then again at our sort of what of our recommendations are important times to get the commission involved before it comes before the full commission, be my point. Um, uh, Dorothea, just to answer your question you raised, uh, yes. I did speak to Selectman Lefkowitz when I was uh, interviewing, I guess, to come on the commission not that yep. not that long ago. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we had agreed that I would start to take a look at would be, um, is, as she's also running the equity task force, um, taking a look at hiring practices and that kind of thing, which I spoke with the chief about. So I did mention previously, it looks like the 18th, next Tuesday will be the day I'm going to go take a look at the um, the CPAT, the entrance portion, and then uh, start taking a look at what additional things we can do for recruiting uh, to try to do some more outreach in the different areas. So I've done some background research, the chief and uh, the deputy chief have given me some insight as well as the, uh, the union president. So uh, I don't think anything will be super contentious coming back. Um, it'll just be more, you know, how can we how can we try to help support the department uh, given the, the limited means they've been given to kind of work on this issue. All right, Alex, is your testing um, in the morning or the afternoon? Your CPAT. On the ET. Sorry, I'm, talk, I'm talking to myself in the muted mic. Yes. Um, so the state fire folks have asked me to be there at 10 o'clock on Tuesday. And I guess while the uh, students are going through another refresher before they run their course, then I'm going to run it at 10 o'clock. So if you'd like to see a chubby suburban dad run the course, you're more than welcome to join. Oh, well, I haven't seen the course done, so maybe I have to be back down in Norwalk, but not until 2.30. So if you'd send me the information, that'd be great. Yes, you should be back from the hospital by then. <laughs> Thanks, Chief. Good call. <laughs> um, and thank that you, Alex. That's, ex that's exactly the kind of thing that we need to pick up on and sort of each pick some areas we want to work on. Chief, the other thing is just uh, because I think you addressed it in writing, but um, your sense of timeline of when plans to do the plan will be done versus when you think you'll have the actual product. So um, what I would like to do is have all the parts and pieces for the planning process in place by uh, November. Um, obviously, uh, longer term studies, contracted studies for response time evaluations, uh, 
um, uh, discussions uh, regarding uh, AMR and ambulances. You know that the, those are will will certainly require. But I think that we can put the process in place um, and um, fill in much of the study detail of uh, the research part of it. Um, uh, certainly by November, if we can have plan to present to the commission at the November meeting, uh, if that's, or maybe even October, uh, if parts of it are available, give us a couple of months so that by December, um, we can finalize that portion of the process. And, so, what, and clearly I need to get my arms around what is deliverable in that time and what is planning to plan for beyond that. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Any questions, Commissioner? Everybody good? Okay. Um, then the rest of your report, Chief. Thank you very uh, much. Straight up, it'll be very brief. Um, the budget uh, is put to bed. Um, we have an additional position. Um, uh, the challenge for the deputy is to manage a, a lean budget, uh, but one that has an important element of a new uh, fire inspector in it. Um, and we continue to work uh, to complete our budget management uh, for uh, the current fiscal year. So uh, all systems that go there. Uh, capital projects update. Uh, we do have uh, and just started, and maybe the deputy is going to talk about it, uh, but we just started uh, the evaluation. Um, we're funded for a new fire pumper, and uh, so we are uh, working on uh, with a committee, uh, very engaged. And, and I think it's important to point out is um, um, the, that committee includes several or three uh, younger um, firefighters that uh, have not previously been on a committee, um, but have shown remarkable interest and capability. Um, and it's part of that succession planning uh, in our planning and apparatus acquisition uh, process. Um, several of the members that uh, have been engaged are uh, in, in this uh, are at or near retirement age, and it's certainly important uh, uh, to bring in uh, folks that uh, for the next 20 years will uh, be part of our specification process for new apparatus. Um, and those so, names are? Pardon me? And those names are? Uh, that's Neil are... Smith, uh, Chris Item, and Justin Renda. Uh, they're working with the deputy chief, Skylar Sherwood, uh, Pat Barry um, is another, um, he's been on the committee, but uh, Scott Bisson uh, was the chair. Uh, Scott Bisson has transferred that responsibility to Pat Barry. Uh, again, uh, a great move to uh, provide, uh, you know, the opportunity for Pat to still have access to Scott Bisson for questions and guidance and, and, and Scott has done a remarkable job with apparatus uh, specification um, for for a, a for many many years uh, under the previous uh, chief as well. And uh, uh, but good to transition those responsibilities to uh, someone else. Uh, and Pat uh, has a, a wealth of knowledge and heavy equipment uh, and apparatus. You remember Pat uh, sourced us the. Um, heavy, uh, the high water rescue vehicle from the military, um, and, uh, in his private, uh, uh, or, uh his uh, second job, uh, has, uh, extensive heavy equipment, uh, experience. So I think it's a, a good team. Uh, uh, the new assistant, uh, the new mechanic, uh, Dave Gillis, uh, is part of that committee. Again, someone that, uh, comes with tremendous knowledge takes over that portion of uh, the process from uh, Rick Demko. Um, and so there, there is a change and you know, I know that the commission has talked about succession planning um, in, in the past. And I think this represents uh, a, a one and maybe a more subtle part of uh, succession planning, but a really important one uh, and engages people. And we've talked about everybody's gonna need, everybody should have a reason to come to work. Uh, every day, and 
uh, including people in these projects, um, uh, gives them uh, a opportunity to participate, uh, apply their skills and abilities, and and be engaged. So uh, I'm very positive about that. And deputy is on that committee, and I don't know, uh, chief, if you wanted to add anything. Uh, I will. Do you want me to uh, when I do my report? I was just yep. going to mention it. Sure. Okay. And lastly, uh, there are two donations uh, that are in your packet. Um, and one is from the Fairfield Beach Residents Association. Um, the uh, uh, President Carolyn Camlet and the uh, FBRA board uh, um, uh, provided a $150 donation to the department. Uh, and we have a $25 uh, donation from Leonor Irwin on Buckley Drive. I need a motion to accept. Move. So move. That's John and Liam. And um, uh, for motion and second, uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, right. Chief, I'm going to. Yeah. Pardon? Go ahead. Um, I'm going to add one to you based on post office conversation. Could you update the commission on the UI meeting today? Because we've talked to them in the past, and so it would be appropriate to give them those the most immediate update. Yep. So, yep. Uh, as you know, we're working with UI uh, to update uh, the storm response. The storm response. <clears throat> Both UI and EverSource uh, were under investigation by the public public utility Re regulatory agency, FERA. Uh, you've probably seen that in the news. Um, Eversource uh, did not do as well as uh, UI. Um, UI properly anticipated the storm, projected the damage, um, you know, struggled with staffing and having enough line crews, which all of them do. Um, this storm, if you remember, East IA at first uh, was impacting Florida and then coming up the coast. Uh, so Florida, gobbled up all of the East Coast resources to stage there, um, and then it did not have the impact um, that they anticipated. They released them, so they were delayed coming to other areas. Uh, the storm went further west of us, so uh, towards New York City, giving us a wind direction and high winds uh, on the east side of the storm, uh, which is the more severe because uh, you have the forward motion of the storm plus the wind speed uh, creates the higher wind conditions. And those winds were coming from the south southeast, which is not how our tree stock in Fairfield is hardened. Uh, so anyway, it, it, there was it, it was a a um, there was enough problems with the utility response uh, that Burr opened up a docket and conducted an investigation. Um, at the same time, you know, that we've been working with UI um, even before this um, uh, to improve our response and coordination with them. Uh, and uh, ESIS uh, clearly identified um, improved communication between us and residents on outages and restoration timelines. We recommended to them that they build. If anybody has seen dashboards for the universities, you've seen how rich they are filled with information about as during COVID of uh, the university's response. So we recommended um, to the uh, utilities, if we can go to a website um, or a dashboard that uh, is always on and always updated for information, uh, and you populate that with the critical information of, you know, down to individual addresses, whether they have power, whether they don't have power, and if they don't, what their restoration projection is. That is a huge piece of information for us. We can make decisions about whether to uh, call for evacuations, whether to open up shelters, whether to do extraordinary things regarding uh, food, water, power, uh, those types of issues, where the hazards might exist, where streets are dead ended uh, or blocked by trees. Um, so they have embraced this concept and are using Fairfield as their, their development hub um, or a development partner 
uh, in this, uh, what will be a nationwide rollout, not only for uh, United Illuminating, but all of the avant-garde grid, avant -grid uh, utility companies in the United States. Uh, so we're on the ground floor. They've hired a data company out of San Diego to develop the resource. Uh, so they are investing considerable uh, funds and uh, devoting a lot of personnel uh, to develop this product because uh, they really see this as a solution uh, for not only us, but uh, their entire system. And today, uh, they presented their update, um, and the new president and CEO, uh, Frank Reynolds, uh, joined us at the meeting and then went and met with the first select woman uh, to bring her up to speed and uh, basically advised that, you know, Fairfield has been, uh, because of our commitment to finding solutions to the problems as opposed to just identifying and finger, finger pointing. Um, that, you know, they found us to be a good partner uh, in this uh, development. So uh, we have asked that uh, they have a working model available for this hurricane season, which in Connecticut starts in August. Uh, so we hope uh, that we will be ready for a presentation uh, and hopefully the commission will be able to participate in that uh, when it gets rolled out in some form, maybe preliminary, maybe beta. Uh, but uh, we're expecting some product uh, by uh, August of this year. So I'm very encouraged that uh, uh, the persistence uh, has been paying off. And instead of arguing in these annual meetings with the utility, uh, they are far more productive and uh, collaborative. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Deputy Chief, you're up. So um, we. Uh, recently received um, new SCBAs as a part of a, a rollout of um, um, new technology. Uh, it's going to be a multi-year pr uh, program, which hopefully will be sped up if we are successful in um, the AFG that we've asked for. Uh, so we'll know possibly in June whether that we're successful in that. Otherwise, we'll continue uh, rolling out equipment as we get it, uh, you know, as we get funds for them. So uh, this new uh, generation of SCBAs give us some added benefits with, uh, you know, better face pieces, better buddy breathing and rescue capability in case one of our own people are down and need to be rescued uh, and, and some other uh, great things. The chief um, spoke about the apparatus committee, which uh, met for the first time for this, uh, for the newly approved pumper. Um, those three young firefighters, you know, I was just wondering why, uh, you know, what, how, uh, how comfortable they would be with the group of senior people that they were sitting with, and they, they were super. Uh, a couple of them had experience with volunteer departments in specking rigs, so it's not their first rodeo. Another had experience because uh, he was evidently, um, uh, he, he worked with a, a larger uh, trucking company or so, and he was, uh, he, he was fluent in, in um, trucks and their spec, spec, uh, specifications. So, but, uh, you know, recently some of the uh, equipment that we've gotten, we've gotten the, the rescue, we've gotten the tower ladder, they're specialized pieces. Now we're coming back to um, specking and wanting to stay ready for the future for a pumper, which is, you know, the main type of apparatus that we have. So. Uh, we, there were a lot of things that we're, that we're really concerned with, and all these people gave their, um, gave their thoughts. Cab with, we're having a lot of trouble uh, fitting in some of these apparatus. Uh, they're a little too narrow. Um, so we're looking at a new cab design, which, uh, which we had a, a re recent purchase from uh, Bridgeport. We asked Bridgeport, and they sent their engine and crew over. Uh, our, our guys got to sit in it and, and felt uh, that, yes, this is the solution. This is, you know, it gives us more space and this is what we need. Uh, water tank size, you know, what are we going to need for our future, uh, you know, uh, our, our future um, fires? Are, should, should we be looking for larger or smaller tanks, larger or smaller uh, pumping capabilities? Foam capabilities, do we want, you know, uh, uh, 
in, in uh, line systems or do we just want uh, to simplify that? Uh, hose bed height, uh, it, 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 it can be difficult for us to uh, get at the hose. It can be difficult for um, injuries if the hose beds are too high. Is, are these hose beds going to be high or what, what is the configuration? Where we're going to keep the ladders um, inside or, or outside the apparatus? You know, do we use them that often that we're going to put them in so that they're uh, a little more protected? Uh, but another thing um, is our people said that we need to uh, find a little more space in the cab, so maybe we need bigger cabs for our EMS uh, equipment because what happens uh, now we're carrying um, certain drugs. We're carrying naloxone and we're carrying um, uh, intramuscular epinephrine. So uh, each winter we wind up bringing them, uh, the bags full of them out of the compartments from the outside, bringing them inside and they're on the floor, we're tripping over them. We need a better system you know, for where we're gonna keep them. So a lot of these things are uh, being worked out by these people who are end users. It's not, it's not me in the fire engine. It's not the mechanics in the fire engine. Uh, it's, it's not, you know, uh, Chief Bisson in the fire engine, but it's, it's these three firefighters who are in the, in the fire engine with the, the Lieutenant, Lieutenant Barry. So they are- As, as are, much as we would like to, right, Chief? Oh, I, I would love to sit in the back, uh, right in the back of the officer and grab the nozzle and, and go into a fire. That's, that's, <laughs> I wish I could do that again. But um, so we're very um, we're very happy at the uh, at the progress that we made in our first meeting, and a lot of these other meetings will be by email, going back and forth, and sharing documents like that. But uh, we, you know, we met and actually had hands on on um, on, on a real apparatus, so uh, you know, it, it gave us a very good perspective. Uh, in regard to personnel, um, graduation is coming up. Two members of the uh, our. Probies uh, are graduating on May 26th, Wednesday. They're going to come back here for local training, uh, but we're going to swear them in on um, the next day, Thursday, May 27th. And if we haven't uh, invited you all, we will, of course. Uh, but so that's Thursday, May 27th at 1600, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, that is, uh, at headquarters. We're going to swear in those two. Um, the third firefighter, remember, he was injured, so we, uh, he won't be sworn in at this time. Uh, the fourth firefighter, Proby, who had gone through the Connecticut Fire Academy, he'll also be sworn in, as well as uh, the most recent lieutenant that uh, we promoted uh, about a month ago or whenever that was, and the uh, most recent hire of uh, our uh, mechanic, um, Dave Gillis. We'll, uh, we'll have the formal swearing in. Uh, with you know, with their families, and hopefully any of you that can make it. Uh, let's see, access control system that we're, we've been working on it uh, installed yesterday and today, and hopefully uh, I believe it'll be finished tomorrow. Um, members uh, are all um, enjoying it down here. They they feel it gives a little bit more um, security uh, to our equipment and to our personnel. Um, to the budget, as the chief said, this is. Um, uh, he was talking about next year's budget. I'm also worried about this year's budget, not worried, but this is the time when um, we ensure that we have enough funds to end out the year, but also just look and see what projects we've been holding in abeyance, just in case we needed those funds, what we can go ahead with. So these are the final, um, the final weeks, and um, you know, we have to be very, very much um, attuned to um, what money is uh, available for our, our use. Uh, so let me see. I don't see Cert on the on the phone tonight. So I just want to uh, mention that um, Demis has approved um, three continuations of uh, well, two continuations of activations, which uh, which is the food distribution, as you all know, and the um, the vans, the uh, vaccine assistance uh, uh, personnel, uh, but also for a Cert extinguisher training, which um, uh, they need to uh, accomplish. So um, I think that's it. Excellent. Thank you. Um, any questions? Um, search not on Southport. We don't have anybody South doing it. Uh, no Stratfield either. Okay. And 1426, we don't have anybody either, right? No. Okay. Uh, any old business? 
Okay, I'm um, just reminding the commissioners to think about the strategic plan and pick um, a topic and get back to me and maybe the next week and also get back to the chief with anything that you think needs to be added as a topic. I already sent him one to further break out what we talked about, which was succession planning and knowledge transfer, which he's obviously doing. Um, and the apparatus is a good thing, but we ought to specifically address it in a strategic plan. Um, if there is nothing else, I will entertain a motion to adjourn at 8.02. So moved, Madam Chair. Motion to adjourn. Okay, that's Alex. Second. Uh, uh, Liam, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you all. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Thanks, Deputy. You're welcome. Good night.